cemetery. She'd been stabbed 25 times. The killer saw Cynthia McLuhan as this object to play with by posing her. It sounds profoundly sick because it is. For three years, police are baffled. The investigation continues until we find out who's responsible. It was a total mystery. Until Sergeant Joe Kenda realizes this case goes much deeper than he ever imagined. And all the experience of all the people in his room have never seen this before. <laughs> Could this be the rarest of criminals? A savagely evil serial killer. When a case becomes cold, it's the ultimate frustration. You are searching for a shadow, a ghost. But do we surrender? Absolutely not. There's one thing that never changes, murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's getting late. And the Uinta Gardens shopping center is looking like a ghost town. The pharmacy is the last store to lock up. The store was being closed at 9.45 by the manager, Joe, and her Linda, who was one of the cashiers. There was snow outside, and it was cold. Is that Cynthia's car? Looks like it. Cynthia worked the cosmetic counter. What's she still doing here? Immediately, this is bad, because she checked out 45 minutes before. The lights were on, and the car was running. Cynthia? and the windshield had some ice scraped off. Where is she? We just thought that was kind of strange. Why would she leave her car just sitting there running? Cynthia! Cynthia! None of it made any sense at all. The worst thing you could possibly think comes to your mind. Cynthia! 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 Three years later, after a long stint in patrol, Sergeant Joe Kenda has recently returned to homicide, but this time not as a detective. I returned to homicide as a supervisor. As the boss, you always have feelings about what you'd like to do to improve things, to change things. So I began reviewing unsolved missing persons cases and unsolved homicide cases to determine if there was any possibility they could now be resolved. Hey Beverly, I need to schedule a meeting. Uh, can you contact everyone in the field and have them here by 12 o'clock sharp? Thanks, bye. All right, gentlemen, listen up. Now, you guys have done one hell of a job last year closing cases. Uh, but this year, I think we can do a little bit better. When Kendrick took over as a sergeant in the Detective Bureau, we welcomed his involvement. He was smart, well-educated, very charismatic. I want to revisit some of the cold cases that we let slip through. The question is, which ones do we look at? Now, I've got a few thoughts, but I want to hear your ideas. With my team of homicide detectives, I wanted some unit cohesion, and I was interested in what they thought about everything. Many heads are better than one. How about you, Lou? Any ideas? Detective Lou Smith had an instinct for it, unlike any other. Well, I didn't work at McLuhan. She went missing in 82. Mm. The Cynthia McLuhan case was one we all really wanted to solve. All right, let's look at the case file. Though none of Kenda's detectives personally worked the case, they knew enough to bring him up to speed. Cynthia McLuhan. She was 22 years old when she went missing. Co-workers found her abandoned vehicle in the parking lot where she worked. No evidence in the car and no witnesses. Okay, then. Who did they talk to first? The family. 
detectives went to the home of Cynthia's mom. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Which is where Cynthia's living with her daughter, Stacy. And Cynthia's friend, Mary, is there also. Look, I know this is all very, very shocking, but we need to know more about your daughter if we're going to find her. Well, Cynthia and Stacy moved in with me recently because money's been a little tight. Cynthia works two jobs, and I help out and watch Stacy. Is she aware of what's going on? No, not really. She keeps asking for her mama, but I don't know what to say. I keep telling her she'll be home soon. Cynthia did everything she did for her girl, for her daughter. Her relationship with her daughter was something that was never separable. What we need to find out is if there was anyone in Cynthia's life who would want to harm her. The next step would be to determine who does Cynthia associate with. People don't get abducted, generally, by a stranger. I don't know. It was a total mystery. I mean, no idea what had happened. Cynthia really did not have enemies. Can't say that there was really anybody that disliked her. What about Stacy's father? Where is he? He and Cynthia were married for a short time, but things didn't work out. They're curious about someone that had a motive to do her harm. And the first and obvious choice is the ex-husband. But he lives in Arizona. Even at the first moment of disappearance, there was never a thought of him doing anything like that. They talked to him on the phone. He is in Arizona. And he provides an alibi the day she goes missing. He's not part of this. How about a boyfriend? Was uh, Cynthia seeing anyone that you know of? Well, recently she's been seeing a guy named Dave. Um, Dave. Winfield. Dave Winfield. And, of course, the detectives are immediately interested in David Winfield. Who is he? Did they end their relationship badly? What do you know about Dave? Is there any, any issues with him? I don't know of any issues during the relationship, but I know that Dave was pretty heartbroken when she ended things. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Good job. What letter is this? No, you don't know? Yeah, sure you do. It's a J. I'll get it. Hello? Hi, it's me. Listen, can we just talk? I love you. If we could just give it another try. Dave, we've talked about this, okay? Cynthia. No, You don't Dave. understand. I'm sorry, I gotta go. Wait. He would do anything to get her back. There was concern on the mother's part that the ex-boyfriend might have tried to abduct her to try to force her into accepting their relationship and going back the way it was. At that point, detectives focused their attention on 34-year-old Dave Winfield. Detectives did some digging. They found out that Dave secretly spent some time at the hide-and-seek. At the time, the hide-and-seek lounge was the largest homosexual bar between the Mississippi River and the West Coast. That information certainly put a different perspective on the case. So apparently he liked both men and women. I'm sure he didn't want people to know about that. Right. In the modern day, homosexuality is universally accepted for the most part. In the 1980s, it was a secret world. In Colorado Springs, having a gay affair was particularly scandalous. It could hurt you at your job. If you were in the military, it could get you discharged. I mean, the ramifications were huge. The speculation might have been that Cynthia somehow discovered this, and Dave Winfield was now trying to suppress that information from coming out. Once Dave found out that we were asking around town about him, he decided to show up at the station. No kidding. Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of Cynthia? I care a lot for Cynthia. I'd never do anything to hurt her. Did she have any issues with your little trips down to the hide-and-seek lounge? What? How do you know about that? 
Look, Mr. Winfield, we're not interested in your private life. We're just trying to figure out, perhaps, would that be a problem for Cynthia if she was aware of that? No. No, okay? Cynthia never knew about that. Even if she did, she wouldn't tell anyone. So, it gives you an insight on Cynthia. She just seemed to be a nice, trustworthy woman. You got an alibi? Yeah. It checked out. So Winfield is out. No opportunity. Okay, so what's next? It turns out that more evidence surfaced the night that uh, Cynthia disappeared. Just two hours after Cynthia McLuhan vanished from work, a sinister clue was discovered at a nearby motel. In doing his nightly rounds, a security guard for one of the motels... What the hell? ...came across some clothing outside of one of the motel rooms. The clothing was just dropped. Dumped in a pile. And under the clothing is a purse. There are credit cards, there is some money. And it also contains Cynthia McLuhan's Colorado driver's license. The motel had no record of Cynthia checking in. And when the items were turned in to police, they quickly caught the attention of detectives. Was the clothing hers? They matched the description that she was last seen wearing when she left work. But not all of her clothes have been accounted for. What do you mean? Her bra and pennies were missing. The clothing that's missing are intimate apparel, so it suggests there may have been some sexual involvement. When there's evidence of abduction and sexual assault, the end result is never good. The room where the clothes were found outside of, did we look into who checked into it? We did. It turns out that the apartment wasn't rented for one week. And nothing materialized from there. Detectives have been all over the area for weeks and didn't turn up any new leads. When someone goes missing, the more time that passes by, the more difficult things become. You have no place to go and nowhere to find your victim until they are found by someone. It was a bone-chilling afternoon. 42 days after Cynthia McLuhan disappeared from A 17-year-old named Robert Stogner was jogging through a cemetery in the west side of Colorado Springs. As Robert went through Fairview Cemetery, he noticed something looked odd. And in fact, as he got closer, This is no longer a missing person's case. Somebody took her and killed her. We're investigating the disappearance of 22-year-old Cynthia McLuhan. She has been missing for 42 days. When her body has been discovered, in Fairview Cemetery. Because it was so cold outside, her body was well preserved. In cold temperatures, aside from the whiteness of the skin, they look the same as they did when they were alive. It's a brutal scene. I responded to the cemetery. Cynthia's body was covered with blood. She'd been stabbed numerous times. She was completely naked except for her shoes and her socks. There are definite signs of sexual assault. Yeah, no doubt. There is rape. There is murder. Her bra and panties are missing from the pilot clothes of the motel. Killer probably kept them for himself. It's often thought that when the killer takes one of the possessions of the victim that it's a trophy. It can be a source of pride when they remember that they were able to subdue another human being. Our bodies just positioned up like that. Yeah, that's strange. 
She's kind of sitting down but bent forward, a very unnatural position. It's not one that would look comfortable. Out of all the homicides I've worked, I don't remember ever coming across a body position just this way. Some sexual criminals will pose the remains and stand back and admire them for a period of time. It sounds profoundly sick because it is. This guy didn't hold anything back, did he? She had been stabbed 25 times. Get some photos. So we know if the sexual assault happened in the cemetery or is it just a nothing ground? Well, it's possible. We didn't see any drag marks or any kind of blood trails. This is a remote cemetery with very little foot traffic, which is precisely why Cynthia's killer brought her there. The ghost, the shadow, shows up in that parking lot. Let go! Shut up! Forcibly puts her in his car, drives to the cemetery, raped her, and immediately killed her in the same spot. And then drove off with her clothing and dumped it in this motel in the central downtown. Canvas of the area turn up anything? Sort of. We came across a guy who said he saw a dark-colored pickup truck leave the cemetery a few weeks before. So we looked throughout the neighborhood to see if we could find a similar pickup truck. One of the people that we find who had owned that pickup truck is a Richie Hyden. He lived two and a half blocks from the Fairview Cemetery. This guy said he was at the cemetery, but he was there because of the great view at Pike's Peak. Sounds a little suspicious, but we couldn't find anything that ties him to Cynthia. There's nothing about him that alarms them. He has an explanation for his behavior. Case went cold. They believed it was someone connected to her that hated her for whatever reason, but they could never determine that anybody she'd ever known hated her for any reason at all. So the case sort of dies. After the notification of finding Cynthia and still no leads, it just went on for a long time, several years of no information or nothing being said about it. Very, very difficult. Okay then, it's time to heat this thing back up. We all agree that Cynthia McClellan is an innocent victim. No doubt about it. That inspires us. John Lou, I want you to take the lead on this one, but we're all gonna be working it with you. This case had a lot of emotional appeal. Personally, this was one I really wanted to take on. So the working theory of the case still remains that it's someone she knew. The reason that's true is stranger crimes are rare. They represent less than 5% of all murders. The first thing we need to do is re-interview the original witnesses and revisit the old leads. Starting with the guy with the dark truck. Uh, what's his name? Richie Hyden. Time has a way of loosening tongues. And everybody, every experienced policeman knows it. All right, let's go. I'm thinking we should start with this guy first because he's got a record a mile long and we're looking for... Hey. So Anderson is assigned a lead about Richie Hyden. Man, Richie Hyden has a sexual assault conviction. It's not all. He's got his employment history. Take a guess at where he worked as a dishwasher in 1982. I'll be damned. Lo and behold, what does he find? During the time of the crime, he worked at the motel where the clothing was discovered. You don't have to be a mathematician to know that two plus two equals four. So, Mr. Hyden, we need to have an up-close-and-personal with you again. We have reopened the Cynthia McLuhan homicide as a cold case. During the course of that work, we have determined an individual who has some very interesting parts to his life. It makes him emerge as a suspect. Kenda and his team would like to speak with 30-year-old Richie Hyden, but he no longer lives by Fairview Cemetery. In fact, he's now on parole in Wyoming. 
Is there a stand up and that to Wyoming? Maybe before we do that, we see if he's worth our time. We knew from Cynthia's autopsy that when Cynthia was uh, sexually assaulted, her killer left behind evidence of his own blood type. So we can compare that with the uh, blood type of a potential suspect and eliminate certain people. The next step in terms of this individual, Mr. Hyden, is to determine what is his blood type. Why don't you check with the lab and let me know what you find out. Sir? So Detective Anderson makes a call to the laboratory and says, what do you know about this guy? Tell me about his blood type. And they tell him that evidence has already been obtained because of the count of sexual assault. All right, just got your eye on like a fist. And as it turns out, his blood type is different than that of the perpetrator of this crime. So despite his truck, despite his criminal record, despite his employment at the hotel, it's not him. Without a suspect, Kanda and his team begin retracing old steps in hopes of sprouting a new lead. The one thing we wanted to do was to go back and talk to Cynthia's close friends at the time. One of those was Mary T's house, the mother's house. Her and Cynthia were best, best friends. I, I assumed that the investigation was over. No, ma'am. The investigation continues until we find out who's responsible. Mary, we're wondering if uh, you might remember anything that you might have forgot to mention when Cynthia first went missing. Mm, well, there, there is something I probably should have said a long time ago. Well, if it's something that might help us find Cynthia's killer, I'm sure she would want us to know. There was a guy that Cynthia was dating that um, nobody knew about. Why was it a secret? Um, he was married. He's married? Really? Now that's interesting. I, I should have said something sooner. Um, I just, I didn't want to say anything in front of Cynthia's mom. And at that point, we were hoping she was still alive. Mary, it's okay. You got to keep in mind, this was her good, good friend. And so I understand why she didn't do it at that point. So who is this guy? His name's Steve Carlton. Um, she had a second job and he worked with her there. You finding everything okay? I am, but you have any socks? Cynthia and Steve Carlton met because he was working as a security guard. According to Mary, he had told Cynthia that he was getting a divorce. Turned out that wasn't the case. Cynthia, I'm sorry. All right, I should have told you sooner. Yeah, you should have, you lying piece of No, I'm the one who looks like the bad guy. Maybe I should just call your wife and see how she feels about all of this. Don't you dare, Cynthia. I love you. Sometimes married men want to protect their wife from ever finding out. Murder is one way to do it. Do you know if Steve still works at the same place? Not that I know of. I, I haven't seen him in a while. I just know he was in the Army. We've well, been very helpful. Thank you for being honest with us. We'll let ourselves out. After learning of Steve Carlton, investigators reach out to Fort Carson to see if he has shown up on their radar. Active military have their own police called the CID, which stands for Criminal Investigation Division. They investigate criminal matters involving active duty military. Sergeant Steve Carlton. Where do I remember that name from? Says in 82, he put in a transfer from South Korea. Really? Now, what month was that? Be December. That was shortly after Cynthia's murder. So our question was, was he trying to distance himself from this murder? Was his request granted? No, it was denied due to poor performance on his part. He's been under investigation multiple times. And what do you do? Sexual misconduct. Turns out this guy is accused of making obscene phone calls to various women on the base. Further, there's been someone going into the ladies' locker rooms on the post and stealing their underwear. And the military police believe it's this guy. That's bizarre. Yeah.
you can stay there. Uh, we're going to need to speak with Mr. Carlton uh, as soon as possible. Are you going to make that happen? Mr. Carlton now emerges. Not only does he have a relationship with our victim, but now we have knowledge that he's potentially involved in sex crimes in the military. That adds up to a suspect. So here we have a married man who is dating Cynthia McLuhan. He's currently under investigation for two minor sexual offenses. So let's go find Mr. Carlton and see what he has to say. Sergeant Carlton, uh, thanks for coming to talk to us. What's this about? Cynthia McLuhan. Cynthia? Did you guys find the guy that killed her? We were told you were having a relationship with her. Is that true? Um, yeah, we did. Mr. Carlton says they became friends, they began to socialize after work on a few occasions, and then they engaged in an extramarital affair. But we ended it a few weeks before she went missing. Whose idea was that? Mine. Was Cynthia upset about that? No. I mean, we both knew what we were doing was wrong. He says he finally decided to break it off because he was afraid his wife would find out. You think I killed Cynthia? We didn't say that. But you were having a secret relationship with her. And we were also made aware of some of the questionable things you did in the past. Like what? Some inappropriate acts sober at Fort Carson. Oh, that's garbage. I didn't do any of that stuff. He vehemently denies both of these crimes. I didn't do it. I never called anybody. I've never been in that locker room. Look, I didn't kill Cynthia. I didn't have any reason to want to harm her. Once when I found out that she was murdered, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know. She was a good person. I swear on my life, I didn't kill Cynthia. Steve Carlton claimed he really cared for her, that he wouldn't have killed her. He seemed very believable. All right, you're free to go. For now. He is just somebody that we thought was interesting, and we've just lost interest in him. With yet another suspect out of the running, the investigation begins to lose steam. Where are we now in this case? Why can't we find a legitimate suspect who has a relationship with our victim? Same dead end we hit three years ago. Huh. Kenda wonders, perhaps he's been going about this the wrong way. Instead of focusing on the victim, what about the crime itself? In this case, think about it. Abduction from a parking lot, rape, extreme knife violence, the way you position the body. I mean, this all seems pretty peculiar. Sexual criminals commit a crime in precisely the same way on every occasion. These are not isolated incidents. These people tend to commit and reoffend all the time. It's what they do. Their appetite increases for the behavior. Okay, are you saying you think this is a serial killer? Well, it's certainly a possibility. But that would mean he's done this before, or at least in the three years since. Let me ask you this. Have either of you been involved in a murder like this before? Because I sure have. Me. What if our guy doesn't have a relationship with our victim? What if our man is a transient? He is a tourist. He's here for a time and then he's gone again. And he is elsewhere doing the same thing. We've never considered it. Which means if we're going to catch this guy, we're going to need to start looking at similar cases outside of Colorado. Let's go. All right, listen up. Kenda and his team expand their search to a national scale. So we put together a broadcast to all law enforcement agencies in the U.S. Describing our crime and asking for similar offenses in their jurisdiction. From huge departments to tiny ones. The 
national broadcast is out for a while and we're not getting much results. Hey, Kenda, I think I've got something here. But all of a sudden, we do. It's from Florida. Lou Smith found a correspondence from a homicide detective in St. Petersburg, Florida, mentioning a James Lamar Rhodes. The guy's 26 years old. It says here he's raped and attempted murder of four different girls with a knife. He's also suspected of two full-blown murders. Sound familiar? Rhodes had abducted four young girls in 45 days. One of them sounded remarkably similar to Cynthia's. In June of 1984, a 17-year-old girl who worked at an ice cream shop went outside end of her shift. Hey, you want to go for a jog? And a man approached her. Come on. What are you doing? Let me go. The band then took her to a secluded place by some railroad tracks and proceeded to rape her and stab her repeatedly. James Rhodes left her for dead. But she did not die. Somehow she survived and was able to identify Rose as a suspect, and the physical evidence confirmed it. And guess where the bastard was December 82? Colorado Springs. He was living in Colorado Springs for approximately 60 days during the time frame that the Cynthia McLuhan case occurred. That's why we find this guy. Well, he's currently in Florida prison. He's serving six consecutive life sentences for... Attempted murder. Looks like we need to go to Florida. When somebody gives you a series of facts that are so good, that fit perfectly with what you're doing, you can feel it. This is him. James Lamar Rhodes is our target. We need to go to Florida and have him tell us that. Well, the only way to get this sicko is to get a confession from him. You know, I'm gay. I selected Detective Smith because Smith had a gift. He was the most remarkable interrogator I have ever seen. It was almost as if Lou Smith could walk into a field full of cows and in 15 minutes they'll be offering him free milk. All right, we need to learn as much as we can about him. Anderson, I want you to lead the research on this guy. You got him. Let's do this. It's important when a detective sits down with a suspect that you're armed with as much information as you can. While Smith is en route to Florida, Kenda's team is preparing background info to pass on to him. Can you hang on a second? So what do you got from Anderson? This guy definitely had his issues. We pulled his psychological profile from the state of Florida. It seems he grew up in a dysfunctional family. I gotta call you back. Thanks. Bye. James Earl suffered a great deal of trauma in his growing up. Watching his father beat his mother. He getting beaten up by his mother. Full of violence. So apparently he had a pretty tumultuous relationship with his mother. James Rhodes reports his mother is a brutal woman. I'm warning you. Get your ass over here. She would hit him mercilessly and, in fact, encouraged him in many ways to embrace violence. It seemed he could have harbored hate for women that may have come from his mother. He was so filled with hate for his mother. He left home when he was 14, and he literally became a drifter. Looks like Schmidt's gonna have his hands full with this guy. I'd say. The following day. Smith arrives at Florida's Cross City Correctional Center to speak with their number one suspect. 
a smith's opportunity to work his magic. And he is magical. Mr. Rhodes, I'd like to thank you for having this meeting with me. I'm Detective Schmidt. I understand you want to talk about a case? Well, actually, James, I, I really want to talk about you. You see, James, I'm curious as to how you ended up in Colorado a few years back. Ah, uh, no particular reason. I struggled to find work in Texas, so I always loved the mountains. I headed over to Colorado Springs and found a job as a roofer. I did a little carpentry myself. Yeah? Yeah, I was not an expert, but, you know, I did some stuff around the house. Made me feel like a man. Like... I was really in control. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Smith knew how to establish rapport with Rhodes. In a very short period of time, they were chatting as if they were lifelong friends. James, you probably saw a lot of different places when you were, when you were a kid, right? Well, I bet that was hard, having to always be responsible for yourself. You wouldn't know the half of that. What do you mean? You wouldn't believe some of the things I've done in the places I've been. Hell, I'd, I'd write a book about it if they wouldn't throw me in the electric chair. All serial killers are narcissists. They like attention. And I think if it were possible, every psychopathic killer would probably write a book because they would then have a chance to brag about what they did and what would you write about with, during your stay up there in Colorado? Look, I tell you, but I don't want them to fry me. What if I told you that they won't? The DA says he'll take the death penalty off the table. All right, I'll tell you what happened. No. I want you to show me. Smith says, we're going to transport you back to Colorado, and I want you to walk me through this. I want you to show me what you did. All right. What the hell? Not 24 hours later, Kenda picks up Smith and Rhodes at the airport, and they set out on their guided tour of murder. When James Rhodes came back to Colorado, he wanted to show off. He was going to get one more thrill out of it and show how well he did what he did. It was right here. I saw her leaving work. Something just came over me. You didn't know her? I'd never seen her before. She was scraping her windows on her car. Hey. And he walked up behind her. Can I help you? Oh, no, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> Come on. Well, let me help you. No, it's fine. Wait. Get in the car. Shut up. Ah! Ah! He said he threw her in his car. Get in the car. Ah! Shut up. Ah! Now, Cynthia McClellan weighed 107 pounds. He could easily take physical control of her. Let's go. He said he wound up in a cemetery, a secluded area. Right over here. This is where it was. I took out the knife and I told her to get on the ground. Please don't kill me. Get on the ground. I will do anything. Get on the ground. He just roped her. Then he said she tried to grab the knife, and it infuriated him. He said, my arm was just flying with that knife. He said, I normally don't stab people more than a few times. 
I don't know why I stabbed her so many. 25 times, you say? God, that's really nuts, isn't it? Yes, James. It really is nuts. Just like you. Frankly, I think he was enjoying himself so much he couldn't stop. He saw Cynthia McLuhan as this object to play with. And it seems quite possible he continued his play with her by imposing her. He left her. He had her clothing in the car, and he thought he had to get rid of that. So he drove by this motel and dumps the clothing in the purse. What'd you do with her brown panties? I don't remember. I find it hard to believe. He has a good memory, and yet he says he doesn't remember certain things, and that's nonsense. He does remember. All right, let's go. But for whatever reason, he doesn't want to say it. The state of Colorado convicts James Rhodes of first-degree murder and sentences him to life in prison. But he won't be serving that time just yet. Florida has first dibs on this guy. So he goes back to Florida to serve six consecutive life terms. And if he survives that, he comes to Colorado to serve yet another one. Although he's only been convicted of attempted murder in Florida, James Rhodes is suspected of killing up to 10 other young women. However, none of those cases have been proven. One of the major misconceptions about serial killers is that they are crazy. They are not crazy. They are very disturbed. Their impulses seem to reign freely in a way that's more consistent with a wild animal than a human being. He was just a monster. How can somebody do the awful things that he did and leave a little girl without her mother? Cynthia's little girl is now grown. She's had two daughters. And if my sister Cynthia was still here, she would be ecstatic being able to see her two grandchildren. Still heartbroken because she's not here. Initially, everyone believed it was someone that Cynthia knew because that's usually the case. But the reality was that she, unfortunately, breathed the same air as a very rare snake.